ladies and gentlemen. Yesterday, our chairman, Ahmed bin Sulaim, has informed you about the phenomenal growth of the city where I am now living since the last eight years, Dubai, formerly known as the so-called City of Gold, and today one of the three largest trade centers of diamonds in the world. But I don't want to repeat today the same story that our executive chairman brought you yesterday. I want to do two things that is reflect a little bit on the last 15 years and also look a bit forward of what is there to come. And in view of the select audience assembled here in Luanda, I want to address another issue which has caught our attention recently and that is that of the so-called growing pains of the Kimberley process after its 10th anniversary. Although it was proven and it has been proven to be the most successful supply control mechanism that exists in the commodities business. Today, it is being questioned by some Western countries and NGOs on its efficiency. And as you may have heard from Mark, I was part of that old boys club that assembled in Kimberley in the year 2000 in May. I remember it well because it was my first trip to Southern Africa and I was overwhelmed by the atmosphere of this continent, by the beats of its music and by the warmth of its people. And I was then the CEO of what was then called HRD or in Dutch Hoge Raad voor Diamant, today Antwerp World Diamond Council. Obviously that was before I moved to this place, Dubai. Uh, and then in 1999, it was the beginning of a period of seven years that I stood at the head of that organization. Robert Fowler, his name has been mentioned many times here in the last two days, the Canadian ambassador, came to see us in Antwerp. And I remember it as if it was yesterday. And he explained us that we were going to be in trouble. That was a year before the meeting in Kimberley in 2000, it was in 1999. So September 1999 came when I officially took up my position as CEO. And after a few weeks in October, two young kids came to our office, Mark. Charlie Mungooch and Alex Yearsley, two activists of Global Witness. It was their first visit to Antwerp. And they said that according to their sources, all the dirty diamonds which fueled conflicts in Africa were being sold on the market in Antwerp. And that they were particularly worried about the situation in Sierra Leone. I actually immediately understood the seriousness of the situation and I explained it to my board of directors. Nobody listened. This is true, eh? And they thought I was going nuts. So I told them, guys, this is going to hit us in the face beyond any imagination. We need a special task force for this. And I'm going to appoint someone specially to lead this. And his name is Mark van Bokstad. So Mark started this work, which till today is doing so successfully, first at the HRD, later as the technical boss of the World Diamond Council, today still as the chairman of the working group of diamond experts. And it didn't take long it to hit the fan. In a few weeks, we became as if we were infected by the pest. The whole Belgian government didn't want to speak with us anymore. Didn't want to have anything to do anymore with the dirty diamond business. The media attacked us from all sides. And in the meantime, and this is also true, the market in Antwerp didn't understand what was going on. And Mark, he was doing his tour, as he explained you earlier on. And we understood that the only way to pass the storm was to come with solutions, which he also explained you 30 minutes ago. But I also learned then that there is a time for solutions and there is a time for making trouble. And that we were still in the face of making trouble. 
Nobody wanted to hear about solutions then. But we had to do what we had to do. So we went to Angola, where the UN boycott demanded for a tailor-made solution. And it was there, and later, in Sierra Leone, after the Civil War ended, that we tried out this first mechanism of shipments of tamper-proof containers of diamonds with a confirmation slip, as Mark explained to you, I'm repeating actually the same, with a confirmation slip to make sure that the same content that left also arrived at the point of import. It was then that I met the Vice Minister of Mines and Geology of the Republic of Angola, who had been instructed by his chief, His Excellency President Dos Santos, to search for solutions to lift the embargo which was crippling his country. The same Vice Minister Carlos Sumbulas, who is our host today, and with whom we work together to get on a page the first principles of what later indeed became the Kimberley Process Certificate. So I am also so proud to stand here now, Mr. Sumbula, because Angola, together with Kimberley, is the cradle of the Kimberley process. And people generally happen to remember everything after a certain date, but forget everything which has led to the events and forget the people which were crucial for the success of it. But it were, of course, different times. It were times, ladies and gentlemen, that we used to enjoy working together with the NGOs. The NGOs were fighting for a right and just cause. And of course, especially in Africa, people know what that means, fighting for a right and just cause. So the NGOs had the support of the Africans in the first place. And of course it worked. Anno 2013, anno today, diamonds are the best controlled commodity in the world. And we do not need to take lessons from any other business, be it the gold or the cobalt or the tantalum or the tint business. More than 99.5% of the diamonds produced in the world fall under a certification regime. Central African Republic, Ivory Coast, Guinea and Venezuela do not even represent 0.5% of the world production. And in reality we are probably speaking about less than 0.2%. But at the same time, our relations with the NGOs have degraded to a point well below zero. And it's going further down at an amazing speed. So I've asked myself the question, why? why? Why would that be? Why are these NGOs suddenly so dissatisfied with the accomplishments of the Kimberley process and the diamond industry? Definitely not because there are more conflict diamonds than 10 years ago. So why? Why, why is it then? Could it maybe be that these NGOs have become small businesses themselves and that the funds available for them are less so that the competition for funds is stronger and that the need to tell strong stories is higher? Could it be maybe that these NGOs amongst themselves are fighting for their own relevance? Could that maybe be one of the reasons why we are basically with something which I can only describe as fantasies, some would call it lies, but I will call it fantasies, which fit perfectly well in a horror movie, but which lack any factual substance. Like the story two years ago about the torture camp in Marangi, or like the story on the daily killings in the provinces of, of the Lundas one week ago. Stories which are then spread out to news media around the world and which are good for publicity and fundraising, but which are blatantly untrue. So can anyone give me any other reasons why these NGOs do not exercise the same due diligence they ask from us or from the rough diamond buyers over their own suppliers? 
Is that due diligence from the NGO side? You have to be accountable, businesses have to be accountable, politicians have to be accountable, but is it time for NGOs to be accountable for what they tell and what they make us believe? And after having been confronted with the same kind of fantasies, one can understand that the relations are now below freezing level. Because there are limits to which ends you go to reach your goals, even for NGOs. Ladies and gentlemen, if there would be one hair on my head that believed that there were two years ago militaries having a torture camp in Merengue, I would not set one foot anymore in Zimbabwe. And neither would you. I would not be the same person that had worked together with Charmian Gooch, with Alex Sierzy, with Mark van Boxtel, with Carlos Sumbula, if there would be even the most single moment of doubt that this whole story of a torture camp brought by the BBC was a terrible and actually unforgivable lie cooked by some frustrated people within the civil society community after they had left the Kinshasa intercessional and which was then presented to the BBC and went around the globe and was believed by everyone. How far do we go, ladies and gentlemen, before we say no? So indeed, it is time to come to a new understanding inside the Kimberley process. It is time to restore what was the initial gentleman's agreement, what it was all about. So let me come with a solution rather than passing on the hot potato which is what is going on now in the last 18 months since the US is taking over the chair. Obviously, human rights are a precious thing, which should be defended by the highest possible instances. And that was again reconfirmed yesterday by Dr. Rui Mangera, Angola's Ministers of Justice and Human Rights, at this conference. But it should also be examined by instances that can rule above any reasonable doubt. I cannot give the right to judge over whether human rights have been violated to organizations that have accused me wrongly about the existence of torture camps, or more recently about the so-called daily killings in the Lunda provinces. But there are bodies in the world that can judge in all objectivity about these serious concerns. Institutions which have in their structure the experience and the institutional memory to judge. Institutions which we can respect. Institutions we do not depend from funding of foreign governments which have economical interests. And if we can agree on all that, then we don't need all this OECD blah blah blah, which today is being launched to fight against conflict diamonds at the moment that diamonds are probably the most conflict free commodity on the planet. So isn't it rather time to get rid of this perception of being a dirty business? Which business is 100% clean? Which person? Which person is 100% perfect? I'm not. Are you? Isn't 99.9% .9 pretty well done? Because today there are hardly no conflict diamonds anymore. So why creating structures and spend millions of dollars for something that isn't there? If there are human rights violations, they need to be judged by independent institutions that are really independent and are respected as such, that don't cook stories for the sake of their own further existence. That's what we proposed last year to the KP chair, a message clearly not understood. So it's time to repeat it. Let the KP do what the KP does best when we construed it. A certification scheme is a certification scheme and it's not a human rights violation checker. Let judges do what they are used to do. Judge infringements, judge violations. Beyond reasonable doubt, in all objectivity, not biased. I thank you.